Okay, we are with uh, we are on the phone with Femisor. Uh, how are you doing, Femisor? Hi, I'm good. Happy to talk to you. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I'm happy to talk to you. I, I, I suppose, uh, given the circumstances, perhaps not that happy. But uh, can what can you tell us about uh, CC's case? My understanding, which is largely public domain information, is that there was a small group of people heckling this group of young black queer people who were just walking by the bar. They were saying racist, transphobic, homophobic, derogatory things. And then it turned into a fight. CC got cut in the face and one of the people, the guy, ended up dead by stabbing. She initially confessed to it and then she recanted um, some of the friends say that they know who did it and it's one of their friends and they have it recorded. Um, and that's about all I can say about it. I can talk more about her condition in jail. I can talk about trans people and law generally. If you could if you could talk about both those things, those those probably would be uh, be fairly interesting. How yeah. is her condition in, in jail right now? So right now she has she has a huge lump on her face from the cut, which uh, lacerated her salivary gland. I'm not sure if salivary is a word, but her saliva gland. And she is working on getting medical attention for that. Uh, she thinks at this point that she's able to handle it without any court motions or court orders. She is getting at the hormone treatment. There was initially a problem, but she was able to handle it. She was initially for almost a month in isolation, i.e. solitary confinement, and she was put there, quote unquote, for her own protection. How much, uh, um, how much influence do you think the activity that the, uh, the Minneapolis or generally the queer community around here, how much influence do you think that has had on her, on her condition in jail? I mean, I think the fact that people are paying attention is a huge deal. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's a lot of really impressive organizing going on. I can tell that there's, there are people ready to jump into action as soon as there are specific requests given. There are a lot of people contacting me, asking me how they can help. There's a lot, there's a tough time more people contacting Katie Birch at Tyson and people at out front no, asking no. about the case. What is, uh, what is Tyson for, for our listeners? Tyson is TYS and Trans Youth Support Network. They're involved in organizing the community response. Okay. And I know that the community response has four subcommittees or working groups. One of them is legal, one of them is media, one of them is financial support, and one of them is community healing or something like that. Um, there are two people in the legal working group who I'm in close con contact with. There's also Rebecca Wagner at the Outfront Anti-Violence Program who's in the legal working group. I talked to her a little bit today. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't think of anything else that the community can do any better because the response has just been phenomenal. There's so many people who turned out both for her court appearance and for the community meeting. I wasn't there. Oh yeah, uh, Femisor, do, do you have a? You said that uh, you had something to say about about generally about trans or or uh, gender ambiguous people in uh, right. prison. Uh, well, a really good resource on this is the National Trans Discrimination Survey, which uh, was released in February, early February, by the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force and the National Center for Transgender Equality. They have a really thorough, really methodologically sound survey of trans and gender non-conforming people across the United States. And it includes a lot of information about people's experiences with prison industrial complex, with law enforcement officers, um, with jail, stuff like that. And I can also tell you what little I know about uh, trans people's situations in prison in Minnesota. Yeah, I, we would love to hear about that, quite frankly. I'm going to pull out my notes. I have 
an interesting interview earlier today where I got more information on this actually. But um, so there is a policy in the Minnesota Department of Corrections. It's policy 202.045, the evaluation and placement of transgender offenders. This covers medical provisions for transgender inmates as well as placement. And for Department of Corrections, which relates only to prison, not to county jail, yeah. um, there is something called the Transgender Committee, which is um, which is sort of an ad hoc com- committee comprised of people from health services, from behavioral health, the director of nursing, and other facility people where the offender is housed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they make recommendations to, what is it, the assistant commissioner of facility services about uh, housing trans and gender non-conforming people. They make their recommendations based on a history of transgender or transsexual related treatment or identifying as gender variant or having other clinical conditions in which gender assignment is unclear. Mm-hmm including cross-dressing or physical features characteristic of a gender different from that assigned at birth. How many, uh, um, do you know how many uh, cases in Minnesota that uh, this group has assisted with uh, for, for individuals in prison uh, here? I do not know. I know that, let's see, the, I think the first, the first transgender policy was created maybe in 2007. Mm, okay. And for wait, either that or it was updated in 2007. Hmm. I kind of think it was updated in 2008. And so uh, in CC, this this wouldn't apply to CC right now because she's in county jail. Right, exactly. Hmm. And so uh, she's currently housed in. Did I talk about this already in the psych ward? No, is, you didn't. Uh, if you did, I immediately forgot. Um, okay, I don't think I didn't. But um, she requested to be transferred from isolation to the psych ward. Ah, like unit. Yeah, that's. I, from what I heard, it was the medical unit or something of that nature. That's what. Right. Okay. And like I had never heard of the medical unit or the psych unit before. Yeah. I thought it was just men's, women's, and then isolation in either of those two. But it sounds like uh, there's this other option or other two options. And she's currently satisfied with where she's staying. So that's a huge relief. Yeah, that's that's pretty, pretty uh, good, uh, relatively. Right. Yeah, I think that's about all the information I have about that. And uh, um, to to uh, to continue on, on this week's week's subject, perhaps a little bit. I'm I'm wondering, uh, Themisor, do you have uh, any personal experience with uh, with uh, the police, law enforcement, or perhaps anyone you know aside from from CC, of course, when it comes to gender ambiguousness? Um, I know several people who are gender non-conforming or trans who have been arrested or who have experienced violence and had to speak with law enforcement officers. I myself was arrested during the RNC, the mm-hmm. Republican National Convention in 2008, and um, when, I mean, I'm cisgender. When I was arrested, we were put on two separate buses, and one was for males and one was for females. And I asked, "What about transgender people?" And the guy was the guy said the cop or whoever said, "You can go with the females." And uh, I said, "Oh, it's not me. I was just curious." But I was pretty pleased with his answer because I was presenting as female and sending me with female. Yeah. Um, so that was one thing. I was pretty shocked by that, actually, and I'm pretty sure that other people who were gender, actually gender non-conforming um, had less pleasant experiences during the RNC. Probably. Uh, I, can, I can imagine. 
Um, do you think? I'm I'm wondering. Um, in this country, it uh, it seems like kind of getting back to to prison uh, generally. It seems like in this country, um, the mentality of a, a penal system is is to um, to seek some sort of revenge a little bit, but I think more so to deny civil liberties uh, to those who are incarcerated. And uh, do you think um, requesting um, certain respect because of, of your uh, transgender status or, uh, or gender ambiguity uh, falls on deaf ears because they are not even caring about hearing any of what you want? Do you think uh, that has a do you think that has bearing on on, uh, on the the police and uh, the prison system? Um, I mean, I'm not sure what I can say authoritatively because I, I'm i not an expert. I haven't read everything there is to read, but... I'm no expert. Like, I'm just wondering what your opinion is. Um, I will say that the prison industrial complex is completely devastating to our community, especially poor communities, especially communities of color. It's infinitely more focused on punitive justice that is punishment than it is on restorative justice yeah. and getting people back into their communities and improving communities, making them healthier. And prison, pretty much, I can't think of any occasion where it does not violate human rights in this country. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are huge problems with violence in prison, both perpetrated by inmates against each other and from what I've read more frequently by guards. At least sexual violence is more frequently perpetrated by guards. Really? Sexual uh, violence is more frequently perpetrated by guards? Yeah, there was a study that just came out, I think from Death, Just Detention International, it's an NGO. Oh, you, you or, broke up a little bit when you said that name. Could you, could you repeat the name real quick? Yeah, Just Detention International. Okay. It's pretty much an anti-sexual violence uh, prisoners' rights organization. Huh. Um, I'm not sure. I can't remember if that's the group that just released this study or if it was someone else. But um, that's interesting. That that actually is is a right interesting study to hear about. Right. I mean, there's so much there's so much popular culture understanding of prison as being about the hierarchies among the inmates, but the violence created by law enforcement officers and guards is not really paid attention to. Yeah. Um, and as far as LGBT status or transgender status, I think this can go several ways. I think it's much more likely that people are particularly stigmatized because of their identity and particularly um, ignored because of their identity, either like they're asking for it because they act gay or... Hmm. Or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, but there's also, in depending on the context, depending on the state, depending on the year, depending on public mood, there is a certain amount of pressure on, on prison facilities to look good, look like they're respecting GLBT rights, look like they're paying attention to what rights organizations are saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, possibly avoid getting sued, but, hmm. I mean, I'm not sure how successful a lawsuit would be. I don't know about any that have happened. Um, well, it's, it's, it's supposed to be uh, rehabilitative in, in some way. It's, it's right. not supposed I mean, to break you. <laughs> right, exactly. And people are, are victims of astronomical rates of violence within prison. Yeah. And that obviously does not contribute to healing or rehabilitation. We're we're probably running close on time. I, I want to I want to thank you, uh, quite frankly, for talking with us uh, this week. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Have a have a good day. All right. You too.